Well, good morning. Here we are. I am uh, recording this early. Uh, hopefully everything will work out and you will see this a little over a week after I've recorded it. Maybe I'll re-record it if, <laughs> if things turn out somehow differently. Or I might even preach it live if the government relinquishes their hold on us. I'm not sure that I am anticipating that. <clears throat> At the beginning of the year, <clears throat> our minds tend to reflect on what happened last year and to consider what we will do next year. And uh, since last year was very trying, most of us would like to do as little reflection as possible, I think. Nevertheless, even the trials of the year ought to inform our outlook uh, for the future. So I began to think about this subject. I wanted to take a little bit of a, at least one message to prepare us for the coming year. Uh, I have um, a couple other plans hopefully will come about over the next few weeks as I'm getting ready for uh, the coming year. This enables me to get a little bit ahead in the book of Acts as well so that we can uh, hit the ground running when it comes to resuming our series in the book of Acts. So I started thinking about a text that might be suitable for this occasion. And, I, and one came to me uh, about, uh, I was thinking about the subject of planning, thinking ahead. And uh, the text that came to my mind was the story of the rich farmer in Luke chapter 12. Now the rich farmer had big plans, but God had other plans. And so that theme seemed to fit uh, somewhat with a, a New Year's Day prospective type of message. However, <clears throat> the theme of the passage, uh, as you start looking at it and considering it, isn't the brevity of life. That, that is certainly there, but that's not what this passage is primarily about. And it's not even about, uh, about the right kind of planning or what kind of plans uh, one should make or, or the... Uh, uh, you know, whether it's right to make plans and so forth. It's not about that at all. In fact, the, the passage hits us much harder than the brevity of life does. Now, we ought to be aware of the brevity of life and live every day as a gift from God, seeking his will above our will. And that is true. It is something that escapes us very easily, uh, as you know, or most of you know, five years ago, I had a heart attack. It was a pretty uh, severe attack. It wasn't as bad as our brother Rick Corson has experienced, but it was certainly was life-threatening. And at the time, I became very aware of uh, how short life is, how close we are to eternity, and how we must depend on God uh, every day, and we must live uh, to use our time wisely and carefully and uh, we only have so much time and we can think of all kinds of things that we might say about that kind of experience. But do you know our human nature is such that now after a few years I find that uh, uh, I've become as, as uh, purposeless, <laughs> not purposeless, but as, as, uh, as lazy and, and procrastinating as I've always been. Uh, and I su suspect that's the same with all of us. We very easily slip right back into the old, easy paths of routine, of self-indulgence. We fritter away much of our time. I joke around every year at daylight savings time that I would think that they should institute instead daylight wasting time. Uh, I'm really good at wasting time, and it seems like it would be a natural fit for me and for most people. I think we would do well with that instead of daylight savings time. Uh, but no one seems to take me up on that. I find that that cause is one that I'll probably advocate for the rest of my life and never get any takers. Well, <clears throat> if the theme of this passage isn't the brevity of life, what is it? Well, let's look at the passage and we will see. And I think that as we see, uh, well, let's, let's read the passage and you'll see the theme of the passage really quickly. But I want to, uh, I want to, expand on what it says in just a moment. So let's start there. I'm in Luke chapter 12, and I'm uh, in verse 13. Luke chapter 12 and verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to 
to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods, laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night... Your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Well, that's our passage. And you can see right away that the major theme of this passage is greed. And Jesus is going to counsel in the verses that follow, he's going to counsel his disciples against greed. And the story that he tells makes the point even more emphatically. Now, I... At the outset, I want to say that this isn't just about greed. Uh, greed is the particular failing of human nature that is on display in this passage, but there are many failings of human nature. And they all have a tendency to draw us away from God, just as greed tends to draw us away from God. So as we think about uh, our relationship to God in the coming year and what we uh, should be preparing for in this coming year, then there are many failings that we have that we need to overcome. And so we need to be planning to overcome those failings through certain means. And we'll get to that towards the end of the message. But greed is the, is the presenting sin, if you want to put it that way in this passage. And it is the one that we're going to talk about today. But as I say, there may be some other failings. Maybe greed is not a large failing in your life, not a prominent one. It may not be the most prominent one. I'm sure that it is not a one that you completely escape. And that's because greed is a universal problem. That's our first point. Greed is a universal problem. Now we're going to be seeing that, I think, in this text in two ways. But let's think about what greed is. I looked, went to the dictionary to look for some definitions, and I happen to have on my computer two editions of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the 10th and the 11th. I don't know if they've had a 12th or 13th or anything since then, but these are the ones that happen to be on my computer. So the 10th edition said, Ex uh, excessive or reprehensible acquisitiveness. That's what greed is. Excessive or reprehensible acquisitiveness, or avarice it gave as a, as a synonym. The 11th edition said, a selfish and excessive desire for more of something, in brackets, as money, than is needed. All right, A selfish and excessive desire for more of something than is needed. Now, that's typically what we think about with greed. Uh, obviously a man has to eat, but if he is greedy for food, he will just be uh, pursue uh, more than he needs. Uh, he will overindulge. That demonstrates greed, as at least as one of his problems. Or if it's money, as, as is often the case, there's always that want for more, for an excessive desire a reprehensible acquisitiveness. But I think when we want to define it according to the Bible, that we uh, want to look at it in a, a slightly different way. It's not simply the desire, uh, too much of a desire for a good thing. Uh, that is greed, but that's, it's more than that. And for that, I want you to look down to verse 20, 21. Paul, or Paul, Luke says, or quotes Jesus as saying, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. That's really what the problem is with greed. It's not simply the desire 
an excessive desire for something, more than is needful. As we mentioned, food or money. We all need money. We have reasons to need money. Uh, But it's not simply a desire for more than we need, but it's a desire to store up treasure for ourselves and not be rich towards God. And I think really that Jesus is touching on the heart of the matter with that statement. Well, in our passage, who are, who is the greedy ones? Well, obviously, the rich farmer is greedy. Uh, he is condemned as uh, greedy. He's shown to be having no thought for spiritual things, and all his mind is on material things. And he is speaking to his soul. And he says, soul, take your ease. Be uh, uh, Eat, drink, and be merry, for you have many years. And God says, but you have not considered that tonight your soul will be required of you. And so this man is greedy. He wants, his whole thought is on earth and accumulating more. And his anticipation is that his empire will just simply continue to grow as the years come. So he should build bigger barns and more of them and, and uh, fill them up because... That's just how life works for him. Now, there's somebody else in our passage who is greedy, and that's that one who sort of prompted this lesson from the Lord, the one who is someone in the crowd. Verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Now, his request appears to have been strictly materialistic with no spiritual overtones, says uh, Tom Constable in his notes about him. And it appears so because of the way the Lord deals with him. Uh, He appears to be exhibiting, in fact, the same problem that the rich farmer had. The same problem, the same problem, the desire for material things as the things that will satisfy one's soul in this earth. So what's really the difference between the two men? Well, the farmer in the parable is wealthy. He's, he has way more than he actually personally needs. He acknowledges that himself. He just needs a bigger barn to store all his stuff in. The complaining son, we don't know what his financial status is. We know that he doesn't have the inheritance, or even a portion of the inheritance. It appears that somehow his older brother has taken it all. Now, obviously, in the Jewish economy, where the older brother was given a double portion, but it appears that perhaps his older brother has somehow arranged things so that this brother is cut out entirely. He has nothing. So it may not be that this man is saying, Lord, make me wealthy, make me rich. Uh, But instead he is saying, you know, give me, you know, more than I have. Uh, Judge against my brother. Speak up against my brother. And the point is that his attitude is rebuked by the Lord as much as the rich farmer. In fact, he uses the rich farmer to rebuke his attitude. So my point in this comparison is that greed doesn't reside only in the rich. People of all classes are well capable of greed. You can have nothing and be extremely greedy. Or you can have much and be extremely greedy. Or you can be in the middle and be extremely greedy. You can. It's a spiritual problem. It's not a it's not, it's not something that is limited to only those who already have a lot or have the ability to accumulate a lot. In fact, few, if any, escape from greed entirely. And let's look within ourselves. All right? have, you, have you escaped greed? Do you desire more than you ought to have? But even more so, if we think about the definition of the Bible, have you desired the things of this world to the extent that God is excluded? Remember what Jesus said in verse 21, So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So where are you? I don't want to exclude myself from that. Where am I? When I think about my desires, my plans, and I do have plans, 
my hopes for the future, the things that I hope to accomplish this year, 2021. What shall you seek in 2021? That's actually the title of this message. Well, I have to confess that I am not greed-free in my own life. I'm sure that's true of all of us. To some extent, that old nature is quite willing to rear its head and call us to, uh, with its siren song, and we are able to follow. Now, one thing to note about greed, it is an interesting um, uh, failing because it is a forward-looking failing. In other words, you know, the, the, the slothful man, uh, the slothful man might be greedy of sleep, I suppose, but, <laughs> but he's not greedy for very much else. And he's not looking forward. His sin is something he just lolls around in right in the moment. He's an existentialist. The greedy person has plans. He has hopes. He has dreams. He has, he has, he's going to work his way for that. In fact, uh, greed is forward-looking. It is not content. It must have more. So this complaining son longs for a share in the inheritance. Now, we should note that in terms of that particular issue, this man comes to Jesus, he refers to him as master or teacher, rabbi. He thinks of Jesus as someone who is, uh, who is uh, qualified to lend weight to his argument. If he would just agree with him that it is unjust, his brother is not sharing with him the inheritance. And, uh, and we note here that neither Jesus nor Luke make any comment on the legitimacy of the man's claim. In fact, the man may have very well been right. His brother is unjust in his treatment of him. But what Jesus really narrows in on is what I think is implied about this man, that the money itself dominates this man. He's greedy. <coughs> Excuse me. He... He wants, uh, he wants to accumulate wealth in this world. Now we know the rich farmer, his mind only thinks of what will I do in the future with all my stuff. And his answer, uh, he self-counsels himself, he says he wants to build bigger barns. He wants more and he will plan for that. And he's going to make an effort. Uh, the the, the uh, complaining son, he is... His plan is to gain adherence to his cause. He wants to lend weight to his argument. He wants to go to his brother and say, well, you see, the, the rabbi Jesus told me that I was right and you need to give me a share. And perhaps he's gaining a, uh, a collection of opinions in his favor. I don't know about that. But in any case, he is trying to sway the situation to his advantage. He's working forward towards this. So, <clears throat> greed desires more and works out schemes to get more. Greed is a planner, as I said, unlike sloth. Greed, greed is often a worker. He's industrious. He's busy. He's, uh, he is really, uh, he is, in many ways, he is an upstanding citizen. He's, he is a, he's got a good work ethic. And so, uh, we think about uh, this about the, the uh, this is how we think about greed. This is what it is: this desire for more and the desire to the willingness to sacrifice to get more. Now, as we look forward to the coming year, how should this understanding affect our planning? You know, we may have plans of what we should do as a church. We may have plans about what we should do in our personal lives. What should we do? Now, stay with me. Uh, you may not anticipate all of the answers that I am going to come up with in this message. I think the Lord is teaching us something here that we need to really point to in our own planning as we look forward to the future. The second thing about greed, I said greed is universal. It, it affects every one of us. It affects the rich farmer. It affects this complaining son. It affects every one of us, but greed also does this. It hides behind a reasonable facade. Now, we've already touched on some of this, but here we are, here we have this man, this industrious farmer, the rich farmer, 
And he is planning. He's planning ahead. He knows that this year's crop has been very good, and he happens to have a very fruitful and productive field, uh, farm. How many, it doesn't say how many acres it is, but it, we know it's productive. And he has to do something with all of that produce. He can't just let it go to waste. He's got to wait for the market conditions before he sells it. He may need to store it for some time. He may need to set up a store. He may need to have all kinds of uh, avenues of dispensing with his uh, wealth so that he can convert it into cold, hard cash, as, as uh, Lucy says on peanuts. That's what she likes. Well, uh, so the, uh, let's talk about planning. Planning is valuable. You know, it's something that is important. Uh, if you look in the how-to section of the bookstore, how many books do you think you're going to find on this subject? I actually went online to search on this subject, and it's immediately uh, pages pop up. In fact, a lot of them said, the, the hundred uh, uh, best books for planning, uh, for time management, for, you know, setting a goal, you know, and all of these sorts of things. You, you can find all kinds of uh, articles, we'll survey the best books on all of this. I didn't go into them to see which ones, if they all agreed or not, uh, which ones were uh, involved. I, I suspect that the books on how to plan and how to plan for a successful life are only slightly less than the books that are written on how to lose weight. Uh, those seem to be the two objectives of life. In the sales word that world that I used to inhabit, books on time and management and planning were prevalent. We used to, uh, every so many years, there would somebody be touting a new uh, uh, material by a time manager. I actually, in my uh, library, I think I still have it, I have a set of cassettes on time management. And I remember uh, listening to them uh, back when we listened to cassettes, uh, I remember listening to them, you know, trying to implement some of that in my life. I'm not the most organized person, as you know, so we're, it's it's questionable how much it affected me. But it was, you know, people talked about these things, and and uh, of course, certainly time management is prudent, and planning is prudent, and so forth. I remember people talking about Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, or something like that. I don't remember exactly what his title was, and many people follow that. They think that's the way to organize your life. One per book I particularly like, uh, and I have this one, it's by David Allen, and it's called Getting Things Done. I've never finished it. <laughs> I, I started the book, and I just didn't get it done. So I'm not sure how, influ how influential it was in my life. I do understand his principles, and uh, I, I have used some of it to some extent, uh, but I'm not a big planner. Uh, I, uh, I, I kid around and say that Canada's model is we muddle along. Well, that's, I don't know if that's Canada's model, but it certainly is, certainly is my model, motto, rather. So uh, now let's talk more about planning. You know, the Bible does teach about planning and working and having a healthy work ethic. You know that it does that. And, you know, especially in the Proverbs, you know, the wise person is a person who's diligent, who works hard, who plans ahead. And there are many verses that will address this subject, and certainly sloth is discouraged, and, and so on and so forth. One verse that I've memorized, and of course it was sort of a joke when we were students because we would twist it for our own purposes. But uh, I'm going to quote it to you in the King James Version because that's the way I've memorized it. Proverbs 10.4 He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Right? So the wisdom, the hand of the diligent maketh rich. It's not a negative thing. No worthwhile effort or project will succeed without diligent foresight and planning. Now where I live, uh, right now, they are in the midst of widening a section of the highway, the Souk Road. There's about a mile and a half, from what I understand, uh, is going to be wide right around. They're going to cut around the other side of the 17-mile uh, pub, and they're going to straighten the road, and they're knocking down trees. And you know, that was announced, actually, 
uh, a couple of years ago that they were going to do this. Plans were published in the newspaper. There were uh, you know, signs put up. And in fact, when it was announced, it was announced that they had already gone to all of those homeowners en route and certain houses were bought out. And some of them had been moved. Houses have been uprooted from their foundations and moved away. And now they're taking trees down. That was several years ago. This has been in, in the works, in planning stages for quite some time. You know, they are not going to build a highway through those rocks and those trees without planning, without foresight and planning. And the same when you're building a house. You have to get plans. You have to get plans approved. You have to follow certain uh, protocols, building codes, and then you have to organize the trades and you have to get everything in uh, time and it's a real nightmare in certain respects, but it takes planning and foresight and thought, doesn't it? Growing a business. You need a business plan. You have, you have to have a, a clue about what you're going to do in order to uh, create a living, breathing business that actually becomes productive. And of course, even with great planning, some of them fail. But, uh, and building a life. Building a life. Building a successful life requires a certain level of planning. Although many of us are very haphazard about this, aren't we? You know, planning. Uh, that is something I've heard about. I, you know, we don't necessarily uh, do much of it, but we have heard about it and think that it might be a good idea for some people. Well, when we read this parable about the rich farmer, I want you to notice that Jesus is not, and God is not condemning the man for his planning. It wasn't the fact that he said, look, I've got this great harvest, what am I going to do with it? I need to build bigger barns. That wasn't the man's problem. In fact, his planning seems reasonable. If we were to stop the story right there, we would say, yeah, you know, good plan. You've got to do something with your harvest. You need, it's prudent. It's the best use of your, uh, of your resources. There is a sense in which that kind of foresight could be called godly, prudent foresight, couldn't it? But Jesus is actually pointing deeper. He's saying that this man has a problem in his heart. His heart is the problem. It's not his planning that's the problem. And the problem is that he's putting his faith in material things and not God. And God comes to him and says, tonight your soul is required of you. Tonight your soul is required of you. He's, he's been busy in his life with his plans and his harvests and his fields and his barns and his crops, but he has not been busy with his heart. Well, let's look at the other man in the story, the man who prompts the story, the one in the crowd who comes to him and says, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. The disinherited son is appealing to Jesus about injustice. And as we commented earlier, the disinherited son may very well have righteousness on his side. In fact, it may very well be that he is being unjustly treated. And again, I want you to notice that neither Jesus nor Luke in this story are commenting on whether or not the son's claim was just or unjust. What Jesus warns about is greed. He looks at the heart of the issue with this man. His appeal to justice, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He's appealing to justice. His appeal to justice appears to mask a heart of greed. Now, what I'm trying to say with this point is that those problems that we have in our hearts, we can mask them with things that seem to be righteous, injustice, diligence, these are good causes, but they mask a spiritual problem. And the point Jesus is making is life doesn't depend on material success. Luke 12, 15, on our passage, he says, Then he said to him, them, Beware. To them, and he's actually expanding this and speaking to everyone in the crowd. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. 
For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. The man, this man appears to be dominated by if onlyism. If only my brother would share the inheritance, then all would be all right in my life. All, I could live for God then. Often people will say that. If I only would have this, then I, you know, I could serve God. We can apply this in many ways. If only I had a better car, then I could, you know, whatever. If only I lived somewhere else. Oh, if only I won the lottery. If only I had more education. If only I was raised better. Or for Rob, if only I was graded more fairly in school. <laughs> That's a joke in our family that he constantly raises for some reason. Well, <clears throat> uh, there is this man, Jesus says to this man, or he warns about every form of greed. Now, greed isn't just about money, but it is about what constitutes a full life. And so, you know, you say, well, you know, money doesn't matter to me. I'm not, I, you know, I have some, I have a job, I have, uh, or had a job, and I've saved some, and whatever it is, I've got a pension, but it's not really that important to me. I try to live carefully and frugally, but there might be something else that is the object of your life that dominates your thinking and doesn't leave much room for God. The things men pine for can carry a cloak of reason and a veneer of respectability. And they can drag us away from serving God. We can desire, we can be greedy for political things. In this last few months, we've seen an election in British Columbia, an election in the United States. We've seen through this last year, this terrible COVID crisis. And we can become so obsessed with that, if only we could get past this. I've thought that. If only we could get past this. If only the voters had done a certain thing. If only, you know, they hadn't been fraudulent or not, whichever your perspective is. And, and these things can distract us from giving our whole hearts to God. And so <clears throat> we have this facade of reasonableness with greed. The rich man had a, a facade. The, the disinherited son had a facade. But what it hides, what the facade hides, is the unreasonable interior of the greedy heart. It assumes that what is lacking in an unsatisfied life is some material good. You know, my life would be satisfied if only I could have, you name it, whatever it is. It elevates material good to the place that only God should occupy. In Colossians 3, uh, Colossians 3 starts off, set your affections on things above, where, uh, uh, in heavenly places. All right? and you read those first few verses, very, very clear call to get your mind and your focus on God. And then verse 5 says this, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. And then he adds this, which amounts to idolatry. Which amounts to idolatry. So behind the facade of prudence and planning lies idolatry. At least for this man. Now remember, we're not condemning planning. Behind the facade of justice and fairness for this son lies idolatry. Now we're not condemning justice and fairness. But, where is God in the picture for these two men? So taking all this into consideration, how should we approach the coming year? Well, we need to grant God the glory in all of our lives. We need to plan first for God. 
In a way, this, this point should be obvious to us. We need to make plans for the coming year. We certainly do. There's things that we need to take. We have responsibilities. We need to take care of our responsibilities. There are bills that we need to pay as individuals. And so we're going to have to plan for that and take responsibility as much as we can. Obviously, there are things that are beyond our control and could completely throw our plans out the window. But we do need to make plans and to be prudent. All right? Uh, we have projects around our house. I'm sure if you are a homeowner, you can think of things that must be done in order to maintain your property, and they need to be done this year, and some can be put off until next year, but they have to be done. You're going to have to plan for that. You may have goals and desires for your family that require planning and forethought to accomplish. If you have young children, there are years to come that you are thinking about, even now, that you would like to plan for as best you can. You have a job, you have a career, you, have a, you may have a retirement. All of these require prayerful thought and planning. We must, however, make our plans in submission to God. And I think that's really what I'm driving at. I'm really trying to emphasize that in our church in this year, we should have a heart that while we have to live in a world and we have to plan and we do have to have money, and we do have to have things to accomplish things in this life. But we need to have a heart for God, first of all. James says, in chapter 4 of James, he says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Now that's a plan. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that. That's James, if the Lord wills. You see, what, we're, what I'm advocating today is that your planning for this year uh, should have at its forefront the, your relationship with God. More than anything else, you should be looking to this year to do that. Now, usually in the end of the year or right at the beginning of the year, I have a sermon just on Bible reading. So that is part of your plan. It ought to be a part of your plan for this year. Do you, due to our schedule this year and all the things that have happened, our, this message is a little late into the year, but you can start a program of Bible reading at any time. You can start it this week. Uh, we've made certain plans available. There's many of them available. And I hope you make work of starting with one and following it. And, and uh, we have, uh, maybe you've already started. That's good. That ought to be a part of your plan for this year. Uh, if you've never really had a systematic Bible reading plan, I recommend you start easy. Start with some kind of plan to read through the New Testament. Now, you can read through the New Testament in a month. Well, you could probably read through it in a couple of days if you really sat down to do it and did nothing else. But you could, there's a way to read a new, the whole New Testament in one month. I've done that uh, in, the, in the past. Uh, there was a couple of years where I was doing that every month, reading the New Testament every month. Now that's intense Bible reading. Now most of us don't have that kind of time. And, uh, I, and I don't do it now. So, so don't, don't be on a guilt trip about that. But there, there's many ways to do it. Just start. So start. Have a, have a plan and start working the plan. And if you fall behind, as I said before, just start it up again. Don't worry about that. Just start it up again. And keep at it. Have a plan and work your plan. Plan for your church involvement. Now, right now, we're under restrictions and, and uh, there's certain things we can't do. They're out of our control. We're not able to do what we would like to do as a church. We're sort of hanging on by our fingernails and trying to keep things together. Uh, we have a plan for that. Uh, it's not adequate, but we're doing the best we can. Nevertheless, we, you should be a plan to be as involved in church as possible. So there are ministries that you can even perform as an individual who's separated and distanced from everybody else. There are still ministries that you can perform to reach out to one another. You should be planning for that. It's part of your Christian planning. Uh, 
but in terms of our regular church life, which I believe, I hope and pray and believe that this year we will be able to return to at some point. Uh, It is very easy to allow other things to crowd out church involvement. Other things become so important. Uh, You might be committed to something that takes you out of church on a regular basis. Now, sometimes you... People will take on an extra load at work. And it is a thing that uh, interferes with involvement in church. And they just can't do it. Well, you need to plan around that. You really do. It's not because there's merit in coming to church, or being involved in church. But remember that God is looking at your soul. And you want to have a relationship with him. And that you need to be planning for your daily activities. Sometimes outside interests, not a job. A job is one thing because some jobs do require times that you just have no way of avoiding it. And you have to do the job and it will interfere to some extent with church life. But you need to plan to compensate for that somehow. But you have outside interests. Clubs or sports or what have you. All kinds of things that pull people away. You know, I remember when I was growing up, one thing that our pastors struggled with every summer in the area I grew up in was people who had cabins at the lake. You know, they're working Monday to Friday and they have a cabin at the lake. And so, what happens on Friday night? Off they go to the lake. They're there all Friday night. They're there all day Saturday. And where are they on Sunday? At the lake. Now, it's easy to hit that one because we don't have anybody with a cabin at the lake that I know of. But you see, there could be all kinds of things that are interests. There's nothing wrong with them in themselves. But they hinder your, your relationship with God. You're greedy for that time and that greed pulls you away from God. You should be committed to the mission of the church. And so supporting missions is one way. Supporting the local ministry itself, that's another way. Being an evangelist in your own life, that's a, that's a third way. Now, uh, you don't want to be... Uh, a haphazard evangelist. You want to plan for evangelism. You want to think about how to communicate the gospel. You want to build your skills. You want to grow in your ability to communicate uh, to people. You want to think about how to talk to people. You want to think about people to talk to. You may have some friends or family members and you want to approach them in as best way and wisest way as possible. You don't want to turn them off. And you want them to really understand, to have a hunger and thirst for righteousness, just as you do, and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you should make plans for these things. One of the things that I think we can glean from our text that about the kinds of spiritual plans we should have, I think is in a way we can derive from our text. If you look back to verse 14, one last thing I want to look at in the text. And it says, Jesus is replying to the, the young man, I'm assuming he's a young man, who came and divided the family inheritance. Verse 14, he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or administrator or arbitrator over you? Now, Jesus isn't just dismissing his concerns. He's asking a serious question. Why? Because Jesus is the judge. He is the judge. He said in John's Gospel, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to his Son. Now, here's the question. How would you fare if Jesus judged your life? How would this young man fare? Lord, I've been unjustly treated by my brother. I want my share of the inheritance. All right, if you're wanting me to be a judge over your life, Let's talk about you. And Jesus sifting this young man's life, it appears that the, we don't know how he responded. He went away rebuked. 
The, uh, now, if Jesus were to judge your life, how much greed would he find? How much sloth would he find? How much pride? Who of us can escape that one? Selfishness. And so on. There are... Do we want Jesus as a judge? No, we need Jesus as a Savior. Not as our judge. That's why Jesus came to earth, after all. So... (laughs) This last thing that I want to say, this is why our whole hearts and our planning and our thinking for this year need to be focused on God. We need our Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and not as our judge. If we're judged, we will be found wanting. But we have a Savior who compensates for all our failures. And we can turn to Him and give Him our life. And then He can help us work out the problems that we have besetting us all around us. This brings me to my proposition for this message. This year, submit your plans and your ways to God. That's what the rich farmer needed. That's what this young man needed. That's what you and I need. I want you to put your trust first in Jesus as your Savior and then follow him wholeheartedly as your God. One commentator summed up this passage this way. I thought this was pretty good. To have or to live? To have or to live? Now, which one do you want? What do you want out of life this year? To have or to live? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this passage. What a powerful statement it is to us. Lord, I pray that as we consider it and let it sort of sink down into our hearts, Lord, I pray that you would help us to have life and not to have things. Lord, that our whole heart would be focused on you, that we would give our hearts and lives to serving you this year, that our plans would be centered on you this year, that our church would be faithful to you this year. Every one of us. Lord, I pray that you would work in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And the Lord bless you and make you a blessing this year. Amen.